Today, it's all about soundbars and Dolby Atmos enabled. Most of you know we specialize in designing and building high performance home cinemas. So why would I be talking about soundbars and Dolby Atmos enabled speakers? Well, firstly, this was prompted by a client visit a little while ago, which I'll talk about a bit later. Secondly, many clients start with a soundbar or are trying to build a cinema using Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. And we get lots and lots and lots of questions about these. As they have a lot in common, I thought it'd be handy to explain how these truly work. So let's go. Now, when TVs were first invented, they had quite large mono speakers built to the front of them, facing the viewer, and they were okay, to be honest. Then they moved to stereo with speakers either side of the screen, which was even better. But as time went by, these were deemed to be ugly by customers and marketing experts, etc. And it was soon decided that TVs should have tiny bezels and that the speakers be not seen and, well, not heard, at least not clearly. And the speakers were flattened and made small and hidden at the back of the TV, facing the wall behind them, and the resulting bounce sound was really nothing short of atrocious. So instead of bringing TV speakers back, someone rather cleverly invented the soundbar. So we kind of went full circle really and ended up with TV speakers where they were in the first place, but with a twist. They added surround sound and now Atmos. Now before we go any further, there are a few principles about the behavior of sound that we need to understand to bring this all together. So rule number one, sound, high frequency sound, travels like a laser beam in a straight line from the speaker and this is why it's important that they're aimed at your ears and not at your feet or the floor or anywhere else. It's why in ceiling speakers are not great um, as your normal surround speakers if they don't have like a directional or adjustable tweeter etc. Rule number two, high frequency sounds like we just said are kind of like lasers but they can also bounce off surfaces and be reflected to certain locations just like a laser hitting a mirror but the sound loses a lot of energy and it spreads out quite a lot. So this rule is not without its issues. The third rule, we need to understand that bass operates entirely differently. It ripples just like water on a pond and it builds up and changes its energy depending on its position in the room. And in some places there's lots of bass and in others there's little or none. The sound energy becomes static at the walls, which is where it's loudest and you have modes, nodes, and antinodes, and all sorts of things going on. But basically, they're standing waves in the room, and this has a very big impact on what you actually hear. I'm just going to make a change here. Let's get rid of the soundbar and put up a system that you might be familiar with. Check this out. This could be recognized as something like a lifestyle or a Bose system. So, that in place, let's have a look at rule number four. You need to understand that we, as human beings here, when we hear a high frequency sound, we think the associated low frequency sound is coming from the same place, even if it isn't. We can have the low frequency drivers, the subwoofers, in a different location, but our ears and our brain thinks the sound is all coming from the small speaker, and Bose really understood that. Right, now with these rules in place, and take notes, there'll be a test at the end, we can move on. When they make a sound bar, they have a left, right, and center speaker in them. And I, I believe it's Altec Lansing who's attributed with making the first soundbar. Now, uh, if we actually take a look at this and spin this around to the top, what we can see is that sound stage is not very wide at all. In fact, it's pretty awful. Yes, he is sitting a long way back in this model, but even so, the sound stage is only ever as wide as the soundbar. As a quick side note, at HT, we often don't do soundbars. If they are required, instead we do something that looks similar. We supply three LCR speakers, we lay them out like a soundbar and use a subwoofer or two, and the result is far better sound. Anyway, on with the show. What they realized was uh, they could fire a beam of sound off the wall over here and up to the person's ears to create a form of surround sound. And of course, they could do the same on the other wall as well. When we take a look at that from the top, we can see that we've now bounced sound off this wall, um, and the same happens on the other side. But this is actually quite interesting, because what if your house is open over here? If there's a corridor or a kitchen or something else? Well, the sound just disappears up that hole, and it doesn't really work at all. And now it sounds like everything's kind of 
biased towards the right side of the room. But there's another problem as well. The problem is that this little beam has traveled this distance, but the surround sound has hit the wall there, and then it's had to bounce back to here, and it's traveled much further, and it loses energy when it hits the wall. The other thing that happens is the beam of sound gets wider as we get further away from speakers. All beams of sound do, but because it's traveled further, this beam of sound has actually got quite wide indeed, and it's become very dispersed or spread out. You can see that we need the room to be square or rectangular with hard surfaces, therefore you can't have curtains and soft areas to get this all to happen. We also need this speaker here to be higher powered because it has to travel more distance and get to your ears without distortion to sound like it's the same level as the other speakers in the room. After all this, they got even cleverer. What they decided to do to get around this was they started playing with psychoacoustics and they worked out that if they change the delay and the phase and alter a few things uh, and the way the sound arrives at your ears, they can trick your ears into thinking that the sound has actually come from beside us, behind us, or even above us. Let's take another look at this room from the top. There's another issue, and it's quite simply that these sounds are reflecting from here, so they're going to sound like they're coming from there on the wall, and in fact, they're gonna sound like they're coming from way over here which is way forward of Dolby's very own recommended locations. It's much further down the wall than you'd normally have it. And in fact, if we went to a 5.1 system like this, we can see that the speaker should be way over here somewhere. All right, so we have a few issues with these soundbars if they're going to try and operate as surround solutions. Obviously, the other thing you ideally need with a soundbar is a subwoof, which most have. But most of all, you have to have equal reflective walls, left and right, and preferably at the rear for the system to sort of work, and you need to sit at absolutely the right distance for it to work at all. Now, if we have a look at how something like a lifestyle type system works, this is kind of a step in the right direction, because what they've done is they've taken the tiny speakers out of the soundbar, they've put them in approximately the right places. Now these systems are mainly for ambient background music, um, you know, when you're cooking, having dinner, chatting with friends, or enjoying a glass of wine. But the fact of the matter is that because we think the bass comes from where the high frequencies are, you've got something much more closely resembling a surround sound system. The only challenge with that surround sound system is, of course, that some would argue it's not really producing great sound, it's producing good ambient sound, and for that you, need, you know, they really need to be applauded. It is a good solution. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, the problem is that lifestyle systems and soundbars and all those sorts of products were lacking one thing, because as we went from five channels to six and then to seven channels, we realized that something was missing in our lives and maybe it's you, Atmos. <laughs> yes, people realized that they wanted Atmos as well. Now, if we just throw a ceiling in here for now, right, let's pretend we've got Atmos here. Right, the reason I'm shooting this video at all is because I went to a customer's house and he had Atmos enabled speakers. In fact, what we'll do is let's have a look at Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. If you look at a 5.1 system, there are normally five or seven speakers at the base level, and there's obviously no Atmos component. Now, if you haven't put speakers in your ceilings, your other option, according to Dolby and some manufacturers, is these speakers here. These are Dolby Atmos enabled speakers. I'll just turn them on and off a couple of times so you can see them. And if you look at the left and right tower speakers, you'll notice them sitting on top. Okay, with the ceiling in, uh, we're gonna need that because what these speakers do is they fire sound up at the ceiling and then back down again. And they reflect the sound based on the angle somewhere on the floor here. So I rolled up at the customer's house and he said, I can't hear my Atmos. So after some experimenting, we decided to move his seat forward a little bit, which we'll do here, and we found that, well, lo and behold, if we move your seat forward, you actually start to hear something coming from the ceiling. The same problem applies, though the issue is not only do we need a lot more power for these speakers because of the distance, the sound needs to travel, but they also become more diffuse, and they've already been bounced off a surface, so the quality of the Atmos sound is pretty average by the time it gets to you. You'll also notice now, he's not even sitting in the right position for his left and right speakers, so that's a problem too. Let's put him back in his seat and get rid of those two beams. Right, what can we do about this? Well, in his case, what we did was we angled those speakers a bit more. 
Now they come pre-configured, which means they've already decided where you're going to sit in your room and what all your distances are. Thanks for that. Because these angles are set. So we put wedges underneath the speakers, we work the angles out, and then we actually move them until such point as these speakers then reflect on the ceiling and started to give him sound again. The problem is that this sound is not the best quality in the world. It's very diffused. Let's just revisit this for a second. What's the distance that the sound is traveling there compared to the distance that the Atmos enabled sound is traveling? Again, in theory, the speakers need to be more powerful. They need to be able to be played at a higher level without being distorted. And they need to sound like they're coming from the ceiling and they need to sound like they've got all the detail that they should. But this doesn't happen, so again, psychoacoustics is applied to kind of trick us into thinking that it's definitely emanating from the ceiling. But a lot of this sound is coming off axis from the speakers. What's the solution? Well, in all honesty, if you can, then this is the best solution. Put real in-ceiling Atmos speakers in your ceiling, if you can. Why? Well, it overcomes a large percentage of these problems. Now, we've got sound coming from the centre speaker, the left-right speaker. We've also got sound coming from the rear speakers, which is cool. So they're all coming to the right place. And even better still, guess what? We've got sound coming from the Atmos speakers too, at about the same distance, and direct. So there you have it. Now, if I actually just remove the ceiling for a second, then we have a look at our room, and it's all working. Take a look at that. All of a sudden, all of the sound is coming from all of the right places, uh, but we still use a bit of a psychoacoustic trick with the subwoofers to deliver the bass from the subwoofers correctly. Now, we're not going to go into this today, but there's actually a reason that we don't use these as full range speakers, and for those people who are interested, we'll talk about that another day. So look, I hope this explains how this all works, because when you look at getting or using a soundbar, it really helps to understand what's going on in your room. If it's not set up right, it just doesn't work well. But if you sit close enough and you've got a square room, then it could work to some degree, but you have to understand that this is really a fix for bad TV speakers at the end of the day. Can some soundbars sound amazing? Absolutely, and there are some very good ones out there. But just like anything else, if they're set up properly, they sound phenomenal, and by comparison, and I've always said this, you only have to improve over what you had before for some to sound amazing, and the soundbar will do that. And a soundbar, a well designed a well-designed soundbar with some great mid-range drivers in it and a subwoofer and a nicely configured room and everything working together will sound terrific. Likewise, your lifestyle systems, again, if properly set up with your speakers in the right places and really well configured, can sound amazing. But the one thing I personally think that really doesn't sound amazing are soundbars that aren't working in a room. The side reflection thing, even with your psychoacoustics, is for me personally a bit iffy. I don't think you can really say that you're getting true 5.1. But spatial type sound, yes. And I think the other issue is that if you have a look at Dolby Atmos enabled, really, for me, that's not a solution either. If we just go back to putting in our ceiling again and running these sound beeps right from there down to there, and from there, say, down to there, and then we have a look at it with our Atmos speakers in, our proper ones, the Atmos enabled aren't even producing sound in the right place. Again, this is according to Dolby's own specifications. Okay, now you could get around this. You could actually put these Dolby Atmos enabled speakers over here and then fire them up at the ceiling. And that might actually work, providing the angles are correct. And I'd probably be more tempted to do that. But again, you'd have to have a look at those angles and check it out. So what I'm trying to say to you is, don't just slap these things in and assume they're all going to work perfectly. It doesn't matter what system you have, you need to understand how it works, you need to understand how your room impacts it, and that applies to any system at all. So soundbars. If someone's selling you a soundbar with 5.1 or 7 channel surround sound, or even with Atmos, can you imagine how it would work if you've got a vaulted ceiling, or you've got beams on your ceiling, or acoustic treatment on your ceiling, or a big void going up to a second story? Then your Atmos is simply not going to work. The only thing that might work, that might give you some sort of feeling of surround soundishness, is the psychoacoustics. So look, I hope this has been a bit of a journey for you. We've gone from a standard TV with speakers behind to the soundbar and explained how that works in a room. We've had a look at how a Bose or lifestyle system sort of works. We've then had a look at how a 5.1 system actually works. 
And then we've had a look at Dolby Atmos enabled. And ultimately, we've had a look at proper 5.1 system with two channel Atmos. Hopefully this has demystified things a little bit and helped people understand that if you're actually trying to get the full capability out of your system, if you're looking for 5.1, if you're looking for 7.1 out of a soundbar, there's a lot that has to happen for it to work. And even if it does, the sound's still not coming from quite the right place, according to Dolby. Even if it's all perfect, you're still relying on the psychoacoustic effects to try and convince you that the sound's coming from in front of you, above you, behind you, etc. Now, I want to be clear, I am not hating on soundbars, and I'm not hating on Bose or lifestyle systems, they all have their place. What I'm saying is it pays to understand how it all works, like everything in life. And if you learn how to optimise it and learn what the shortcomings are, then you're less likely to be sold a lemon or be disappointed. So don't be sold or promised anything and then get home and realise you've got a kitchen on your left or a corridor on your right or doors to the back garden or soft curtains all over the place and you're expecting this amazing surround sound. What you may have is spacious sound and honestly if you've never heard true surround sound before that might make you very happy indeed and that's great and I don't want to burst your bubble but it's a case of incremental knowledge and as you move on to true 5.1 or 5.1.2 or multi-channel formats, then you're really going to see some massive improvements. Look, I hope you've enjoyed this. Tell me your thoughts. Do you agree or disagree? Had you thought about this or did you already know all this? I'd love to hear your feedback. So thanks again. Please like, subscribe and ring the bell. Get the notifications and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for joining us.